delay. Welcome everyone to Fusion EV Docs, a student-led webinar on fusion science and technology. I'd like to remind you that this webinar is being recorded and will be made available in the next few days on our YouTube channel alongside a broad selection of fusion science and engineering docs. This webinar is going to be 20 minutes long with 10 minutes open for question, but Patrick, you're welcome to take some of the discussion offline if you're uh, willing to do so, and we'll let the link open at the end for a bit of uh, free chatting and uh, um, difficult, more difficult topics, which I sure will run into today. Looking forward uh, to it. <laughs> um, so to ask a question, I'd, um, ask, I, we'd like you to use the hand raising option in the participant box, uh, which will automatically manage the queue for us. When prompted, uh, we'll unmute yourself, We'll unmute you and lower your hand so you don't have to worry about that. And uh, to facilitate the interaction and the call out, please, uh, if you haven't done so, change your name into uh, Latin characters. You're also welcome to leave some anonymous questions in the chat box if you wish to do so. Yeah, once again, we'll leave the meeting open for offline discussions at the end. So my name is Alexi, and I, it's my pleasure to introduce Patrick White, who's a six-year sixth year PhD student at the Nuclear Science and Engineering Department at MIT. Patrick's current research focuses on the developing and evaluating regulatory tools and frameworks for commercial fusion energy. He was a co-author of the 2018 MIT report on the future of nuclear energy in a carbon constrained world and completed his master's thesis in nuclear engineering at MIT on licensing pathways for advanced fission reactors. Before coming to MIT, Patrick received a bachelor's and a master's degree in mechanical engineering for, from Carnegie Mellon University and spent several years working in the US commercial nuclear fission industry. So this Patrick White may not have a Nobel Prize in literature, but he has quite a uh, significant background in, uh, on the topic at hand. So, this, uh, so you're up for a treat. Uh, today he will discuss the major offsites Offsite hazards related to commercial fusion technology and the regulatory tools we can use to demonstrate the safety of fusion technology and how these regulations could affect the design of future fusion power plants. Without further delay, I'll now mute myself and hand over to Patrick. Welcome and enjoy. Great. Thanks so much for the wonderful introduction, Alexi. Uh, let me go ahead and get my screen up here and we'll get started. Great, we'll go ahead and get started then. Well, thank you so much uh, for attending. I'm really excited to see everyone here and share some of the work I've been doing on fusion regulation. So today we're going to be talking about uh, fusion reactors, uh, specifically commercial fusion. What are some of the potential hazards of this technology? And how can we think about the licensing and regulatory approaches that we're going to use for this technology in the future and how that might impact the design, the economics, and kind of the larger fusion ecosystem? So to get started, I want to uh, lead with sentiment about kind of fusion safety in the way it's conventionally thought of. And so this is a quote from a CEO of a major fusion company who said, an important uh, fusion energy technology value proposition is its inherent freedom from safety risks to the general public. And they go on saying that a lot of the risks promulgated for fusion uh, to mitigate the risks, uh, or sorry, um, a lot of the complex regulations for fission might not be necessary for fusion and could really avoid kind of a costly, lengthy licensing process. And the question is, is this aspiration for fusion safety, or this idea of inherent safety, actually realistic? And what are some of the challenges that might face commercial fusion in the future? And how can we try to head those off through design and analysis? So in this talk, I'm going to talk about some of the challenges associated with regulating commercial fusion. Uh, then move into some of the hazards that we might see in a commercial fusion facility and focus in on one of them, uh, tritium, as kind of the, as the significant regulatory hazard. I'll spend some time talking about how we estimate tritium hazards and what could be some potential consequences, and then talk about how different methods that we can use to reduce this tritium hazard and increase uh, fusion safety could impact the design of facilities, the regulation of facilities, and ultimately the economic viability of commercial fusion in the future. So when we talk about commercial fusion, um, and we talk about the safety of fusion technology, we can find that it's challenging for both technical and social reasons. Um, when I look at it, I kind of see technical barriers and social barriers. On the technical barrier side, one of the kind of limitations to having these discussions is a lack of detailed design information. 
uh, we have there are a lot of variation in different commercial technology concepts that we may use in the future. We have limited uh, experience really operating large fusion devices. And there's a lot of uncertainty in kind of the underlying scientific basis for commercial fusion. So we don't have a clear idea of what might the uh, future fusion reactor look like, and therefore assessing its safety is a little challenging. On the social side, um, these might either kind of be implicit or explicit barriers to discussing fusion safety. Um, we have things like trying to, the desire to maintain the current social licensing around fusion and the kind of concerns of inciting the nuclear fears that we see here for fission. Um, we're trying to develop this nascent technology. We want to get a lot of support for what we think could be a technology that changes the energy landscape of the future. And the idea of kind of fear mongering early on really doesn't kind of, it isn't something we want to do. And so that as a result, there's kind of a desire to wait until this technology matures. But I think there are going to be a lot of valid reasons to kind of address safety concerns early on and start to have this discussion. So we know the facilities that we're building, we're building in a smart way. So kind of throughout this talk, I'm gonna really focus in on DT fusion. And the reason I'm focusing on DT fusion is that it seems like it's gonna be the most promising technical pathway to net energy gain. Um, if we take a look at the reactivity of different types of fusion reactions, we find that the DT fusion reaction, the deuterium tritium fusion reaction, has orders of magnitude or higher cross sections at an order of magnitude lower temperatures. So if we're looking at how to get to fusion most quickly, it's probably gonna be a DT fusion device but the main problem is gonna be tritium. One of the major fuel sources for this reaction is tritium and it's gonna be radioactive. And so this is gonna be kind of an irreducible challenge in the design of commercial fusion facilities that use DT. We're gonna have this radioactive fuel and specifically radioactive hydrogen. So it's gonna be highly mobile, it can be oxidized into water and it's got some other challenges. So when we, take it, when we think about commercial fusion, this is gonna be kind of an underlying challenge. So if we, take a little, if we take another step back and we look at prior work on kind of licensing large fusion facilities, specifically on large uh, DT tokamaks, um, a lot of them have really kind of uh, either said that we're going to regulate fusion, like we regulate fission, or kind of leave the licensing question open in general. So uh, there was a project at the Argonne National Lab, uh, Starfire in the 1980s, which ultimately proposed that they would just modify the review requirements for fission products or for fission projects. There uh, is the ITER license device and the demo proposed device in the EU, uh, which really regulates using rules for commercial fission, but have adapted them slightly to fusion devices. Um, they really kind of uh, use what's called the confinement based safety, the idea of having multiple barriers uh, to limit the release of radioactive material during accidents. And it's very similar to the fission approach to safety. Uh, we can also look at things like the U.S. Department of Energy in the mid-1990s had a set of proposed requirements for safety of, uh, safety of fusion devices. And they ultimately kind of settled on a functional safety requirement that made sense for fusion, but was based on prior DOE guidance on fission facilities. So you can see we've made a lot of strides in the technical approaches to fusion, but the idea of uh, fusion licensing and fusion safety is still a bit of an open topic. So when we talk about regulation and we talk about licensing moving forward, really what regulation is, is the idea of reducing kind of the hazard consequences to acceptable levels. And if we take a look at just any kind of fusion power plant here, just for a picture, for uh, no judgment on any kind of technology, I picked these, uh, the uh, design currently proposed by MIT, um, mostly because they had a wonderful diagram. If this is our commercial fusion power plant, we need to think about what are the hazards that can be associated with a commercial fusion facility and how do we characterize them? So if we draw a nice little box around any commercial fusion power plant, we can kind of define a site boundary as the edge of what are gonna be hazards that are on site and are potentially gonna affect just the facility and what hazards are gonna be off site and affect things outside the facility. So when we talk about on-site hazards, we're gonna be thinking about things like worker safety, operational reliability, and asset protection. What are the hazards that could injure or kill workers, could limit the, uh, essentially the operation of the device or could damage the device in some way? We then also have off-site hazards. And these are gonna be hazards that are potential consequences to public health and safety or maybe to environmental protection. And when we take a look at the regulation of different technologies, whether it's fission technologies, um, the chemical industry, and any, kind of any other major industry, we find that off-site hazards often drive the regulatory conversation. Uh, put a little more bluntly, the public has a much lower tolerance for any kind of facility that might 
uh, are, uh, harm, injure, or kill the neighbors around the facility as opposed to the workers on site. So a really big question is, what are these potential offsite hazards for fusion? What are the things that the neighbors might have to worry about? And what are the things we can design against? So we can talk about uh, the hazards of facility by going through kind of different categories and saying, okay, what might apply to a commercial fusion facility? So if we start at um, kind of a standard industrial hazard and we take a look at a future commercial fusion facility, we'll find things like high voltage, high current, maybe heavy equipment, high magnetic fields. If we think about temperature and pressure hazards for a commercial fusion facility, we might find things like high temperature, high pressure systems, cryogenic temperatures or vacuum systems. These are potential hazards. Um, in terms of energetics, we can find there's gonna be stored energy in the magnets. That's gonna be a potential hazard on site. Um, explosive gases, maybe, maybe radioactive decay heat. We're gonna have chemical hazards in a commercial fusion facility, toxic materials. Uh, one great example is beryllium. Beryllium is a material that's gonna be really common, um, looking forward at potentially as a neutron multiplier material, but it does have some toxic concerns uh, if you ingest it or inhale it. So that's gonna be another kind of potential specific hazard we'd be worried about. And then finally, there are gonna be radiological hazards. This can be things like radiation shine, actual radiation coming off of a facility or device, um, materials that have been activated through neutron radiation or tritium and tritiated materials, materials that have absorbed tritium and now contain tritium. And so this is a long list of hazards, but if we break it down into this idea of what are on-site hazards and what are off-site hazards, what we find is that for the most part, they're on-site hazards. Um, a lot of the things that we're seeing at a commercial fusion facility are really gonna be kind of limited within that site boundary. And therefore, from this kind of big picture of what are the regulatory challenges, probably aren't gonna be significant. The one that might be a challenge, however, is radiological. And specifically, the radiological hazards related to tritium and tritium materials. Uh, like I said earlier, tritium, it's a, it's a isotope of hydrogen. It's very light, it's very mobile, and so it's very easy for it to escape out into the environment and potentially make it offsite and affect people and the environment offsite. So the question is, what are these specific tritium hazards and really what's the magnitude of these hazards? So if we take a look at a very, very simplified block diagram of a commercial fusion facility, uh, what we find is that there are kind of five major boxes that we can use that may have tritium hazards within them and that the tritium inventory is really gonna be dominated by these systems. Um, if we take a look at the very middle and we start with the torus or vacuum vessel, this is where the fusion reactions are gonna occur. Um, after we uh, inject the tritium deuterium into the device, we use vacuum systems that then pull the, un the unspent fuel or the unburned fuel out of the device and uh, any kind of exhaust products like helium or any control gases. We then run it through an exhaust processing system where we separate the gases, uh, send it back up to a reactor refueling system where we then will inject the tritium and uh, deuterium fuel back into the torus. So those are kind of four major systems that we see in kind of the fusion power systems. And then we additionally have a fusion production system. This is gonna be the breeding blanket in most concepts where we're actually trying to breed the tritium fuel that we need to sustain the reaction. So the tritium inventory in a commercial fusion facility will likely be dominated by kind of these five systems. And what we'll find, or what I, what I believe through the work I've been doing, is that the level of regulation is gonna be strongly correlated with the tritium inventory and the offsite hazard consequences. If there is no offsite hazard consequence for the tritium inventory that commercial fusion facility has, I think that it's gonna be very easy to make uh, regulatory and legal arguments. And I, I will say, I say legal arguments in kind of a broad sense, I'm not a lawyer, so please don't take that the wrong way. Um, I think that it's really easy to make technical arguments that a commercial fusion facility doesn't pose a danger to the public and therefore could be regulated just like a chemical facility. But if it starts having stronger and stronger offsite consequences, then it might have stronger regulatory requirements. So, what are these actual kind of offsite hazard consequences and how do we determine them? Well, there's a really simple uh, kind of methodology to think about um, in determining what are these offsite hazard consequences. And it's based on things called the source term, the dispersion, and the dose co conversion. So what this process is, we start with what is the amount of material that we actually have on site, this inventory or source term. We then think about, okay, how does this material make it from on site to some person or some place offsite? And this is a dispersion factor. How is it being dispersed from the central point offsite? And then finally, the dose conversion. Um, once someone is exposed to some kind of material or radioactive material or toxic material, what is that actual physical effect on them? And if we take a product of this inventory source term, 
the dispersion factor and the dose conversion, we can end up calculating the release consequence. And this is kind of a framework to think through how are we talking about the safety of these facilities and how are we talking about the consequences of these facilities. So I'm gonna go ahead and step through each one of these for a very, very simplistic uh, uh, commercial fusion facility to kind of scope out what are possible release consequences that we're interested in. So if we start with the inventory, we can talk about how this inventory is gonna be spread out across these multiple systems that I discussed earlier in different forms. So if we talk about the torus or vacuum vessel, we're gonna have tritium in the form of a gaseous form or plasma. And then we're gonna have some tritium in the form of retained solids. These are tritiums that have been absorbed by kind of dust in the vacuum vessel or by first wall materials. We're then gonna have uh, tritium in the plasma fueling system. This is gonna, gonna really depend on kind of what is our different fueling method. Are we using gas puffs or pellet injection? And then maybe solid titride uh, fuel as a way of kind of storing tritium before we need to inject it into the fueling systems. We're gonna have vacuum systems where we're trying to pull the tritium and other exhausts out of the torus. We're gonna have tritium production systems, which are gonna vary depending on what our breeding and separation methods are. And finally, we're gonna have an exhaust processing system. And this is where we're pulling all of the exhaust gases out of the torus, out of the token, or out of the vacuum vessel, and then processing it into its constituents before we can uh, send it back into the plasma fueling system. And if we take a look at these kind of different forms, different design parameters, the one I wanna focus on today is gonna to be the exhaust processing system. Um, because this has a potential for, significantly, uh, for a significant tritium inventory, depending on some of the design and technology choices that we make as we're looking at uh, building out these commercial scale facilities. So when I say exhaust processing system, I wanted to give a little bit more detail on kind of what the system actually is. So in this case, um, again, just having to stand in for a uh, standard tokamak, um, what you can see is that we start with the tritium atom, and the tritium atom is going to be pulled out through the vessel exhaust. It gets pulled into an exhaust processing system, which may consist of some kind of condensers, oxidizers, isotopic separators, basically separating all the different gas streams that come out of the vessel. And then if necessary, separate out isotopically into deuterium and tritium, separating out the hydrogen species before it's fed back into the uh, plasma fueling system to be re-injected into the reactor. And so that's kind of the general pathway of a tritium atom inside of the system. So if we look at this again, a really interesting question is how long does it take for a tritium atom that's pulled out of the vessel to make it through this whole exhaust processing system and make it back to the plasma fueling system? The reason that this time is important is that if we think about um, the rate at which we're either fueling tritium into the reactor or pulling the tritium out, um, how much time it takes to go through this entire exhaust processing system. The product of those two values will give us the kind of the steady state exhaust processing inventory, the amount of tritium that would be present throughout this entire system at steady state. And so it's a really easy way to kind of give us a back of the envelope um, tritium inventory without having a lot of other information about the specific design. And so if we take a look at ITER as kind of a baseline model, what we find is that if we scale down the power output of ITER from 1,000 megawatts to 500 megawatts, we'd end up with a tritium fueling rate of about one-tenth of a gram of tritium per second. And at ITER, they expect it to take about a 12-hour processing time, or a, a, a kind of a typical processing time would be about 12 hours. At ITER, they're not going to be doing kind of the steady state process, which means that for uh, one-tenth of a gram per second, 0 0.09 grams per, uh, per second, over 12 hours, it means that we'd have kind of a total exhaust processing inventory at steady state of 3.8 kilograms of tritium. Now for anyone that's not familiar with tritium and tritium safety, this might not seem like a lot. I mean, you can easily carry around uh, 3.8 uh, kilograms of most things. Um, one of the challenges is tritium is radioactive and there isn't a lot of tritium currently available on Earth. If you take a look at uh, worldwide in inventories, there's only about seven kilograms of tritium uh, naturally occurring on Earth at any one time. And if you talk about uh, nuclear devices that make tritium, a, a large light water reactor will produce about uh, two grams of tritium per year. And a large uh, can do reactor, which produces significantly more tritium, will produce about 250 grams of tritium per year. So this four kilograms is a significant quantity. And so what would this, quantity actually depend on? Well, if we, talk, if we take a look at kind of that exhaust 
uh, the exhaust rate, that fueling rate, and the exhaust processing time, it's going to depend on a variety of engineering parameters. Um, in terms of the exhaust rate, it's going to depend on things like what's our fueling method? Are we using gas puffing or pellet injection? Um, how efficiently is the uh, tritium actually being burned inside of the fusion reactor? And how much of the tritium is able to recycle back into the plasma before it exits the reactor through the exhaust? And depending on a lot of different factors, including these engineering parameters and the performance of the device, we can end up with a really wide range of values. Um, you can imagine if we had perfectly efficient uh, kind of fueling and burning of tritium inside of the reactor, uh, we'd, every tritium atom that we inject in would be fused, and so no tritium would leave the device. It'd be pretty simple. But uh, based on performance of prior tokamaks and prior fusion devices, we know that's probably not true. And so the, depending, and this is kind of getting into the weeds of the design of these devices, there are kind of current targets of two and a half to about 10 times the fusion rate inside the reactor. And ITER is looking at uh, having a, trit exhaust a tritium exhaust rate of about 100 times the fusion rate inside the reactor. Um, if we take a look at the exhaust processing time, how long does it take for the tritium atom to make it back in? These are going to depend on things like what are our separation methods? Are we using um, different membrane-based separation methods to separate the hydrogen isotopes or to even separate the hydrogen isotopes from non-hydrogen species? Um, or are we using cryogenic methods? What's separation efficiency? Um, how easily are we able to separate those different species? And then what's the required output purity? Do we need to get to a 100% uh, pure tritium and deuterium stream? Or is having a mixed stream OK? And from this, we can get kind of, again, a wide range of values. Um, based on existing technology, it's generally seen that it'll take about 24 hours for a, a tritium atom to be fully processed and re-injected. Um, and that can vary all the way down to one hour, which is kind of a, a long-term technology goal to try to reduce the amount of time it takes to process. But the consequence of both the tritium exhaust rate and the exhaust processing time is that you can have a wide uh, variation in this tritium exhaust system inventory, depending on what your exhaust rate and processing time are. And these are gonna be technology choices. So now that, we, uh, real quick before I move to the next slide, now that we have our inventory, the question is how would this inventory kind of move offsite during an accident analysis? And so there are a lot of different methods and technologies you can use, but probably the simplest is what's called a Gaussian plume model. And this is kind of a simple off-site dispersion model where you see how material moves from a single point uh, released to some other point off-site. And this can depend on a number of factors, including what's the release site, uh, how far are you away from a site, um, what's the weather conditions, geography, plume conditions, and there are a lot of different empirical models or simulations that can be used to kind of calculate what's called the dilution factor, or how much is, are things dispersing as they move off-site. Um, you can imagine the higher the dispersion, the better for someone off-site. You're being exposed to less of kind of the concentrated material that might have been initially released at a single point. And so the, there are a lot of different methods and assumptions you can use. Um, but generally, there'll be a conservative set of calculations that assume a ground level release with calm weather and no local geography effects. It's kind of the simplest analysis you can do, and it gives you a value that should bound all other conditions. So there are a lot of different methods you can use for dispersion, but this is kind of the simplest one if we look at trying to determine what this offsite consequence is. Uh, the final uh, fact, uh, or the final step of kind of calculating these offsite consequences is going to be looking at what, what the actual impacts on someone is. And so this is what's called the dose conversion factor, the DCF. And the way radiation affects someone acutely depends a lot on the different radionuclides that are released and the physical forms of those releases. So we can take a look at external pathways and internal pathways to be exposed to radiation. Um, there are external pathways, things like getting exposed to radiation directly through uh, direct or sky shine. Um, you can be exposed to radiation from, if there's radioactive material suspended in clouds, you can be exposed to radiation from clouds, um, you can have radioactive material dis uh, depo disposed uh, or, or uh, deposited, sorry, directly on your skin, or radioactive material on the ground can potentially irradiate you as well, ground shine. Uh, there are internal pathways such as inhaling radioactive material, ingesting radioactive water or radioactive food, or um, even, um, yeah, radio sorry, ingesting radioactive water or food. Um, if we take a look at tritium and kind of the acute radiation doses related to tritium, really what we're going to find, oh, sorry, 
is that inhalation and skin deposition are gonna be the two major pathways that we're really worried about for acute uh, tritium exposures. Uh, the major reason for this is the radioactive decay uh, of tritium is a low energy beta particle. And a low energy beta particle is really not gonna have any kind of long distance. Um, it's easily stopped by air, by dead skin, or by air, or by um, small amounts of radioactive shielding. So unless you're breathing in radioactive tritium or having radioactive uh, tritiated water deposited on your skin, you're not gonna really have any significant pathway to be exposed to the radiation. So if we talk about these different forms, um, what we find is that for radioactive uh, tritium gas, whether it's uh, HT, DT, or T2, um, based on kind of the biology of this and based on some studies that have done, been done previously by the International Committee on Radiation Protection, uh, there's a recommended dose conversion factor of 1.8 times 10 to the negative 15 sieverts per becquerel. And what this tells us is that for every becquerel of tritium that you inhale in this form, there is a corresponding dose. Now, the challenge with tritium is that in gaseous form, it's not that dangerous. It's really hard for your body to uptake hydrogen gas. But if it's converted into an oxidized form, um, HTO, DTO, or T2O, we find that the dose co conversion factor is about 10,000 times higher. Uh, what you can imagine is that if you inhale uh, tritiated water or get tritiated water on your skin, it's not just going to be immediately dispersed, your body might actually physically uptake it. And this leads to a much higher dose conversion factor. Um, it's a really common assumption to assume that uh, all tritium released during an accident is oxidized because it's very easy to get hydrogen to turn into water. But the challenge is that this ends up being kind of a significant conservatism. You can imagine if your accident is suddenly 10,000 times worse due to oxidation, it's gonna significantly impact your consequences. So now that we've gone through the inventory, the dispersion, and the dose coefficients, I want to talk a little bit about putting these together and running a quick example. So in this case, uh, because uh, uh, I'm doing my research at MIT, I wanted to take a look at what would happen if we replaced a uh, natural gas power plant in an urban area using this very, very simple methodology. Um, so in this case, we replace the Kendall cogeneration station, which is a 267 uh, megawatt electric gas fuel generation plant about two blocks from MIT's campus with just a typical fusion cogeneration station. Again, um, I use the CFS design here, just or the, 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 uh, the diagram put forward by CFS and MIT, but it's just a stand in, so don't, don't read too much into that. Um, but the idea was what would happen if we had a 200 megawatt electric uh, fusion cogeneration station and we use this very simplistic analysis to calculate what the offsite consequences are. Well, if we take a look at that four kilograms of tritium being released in HTO, again, this is kind of conservative, uh, conservative assumption, and we have a simple ground level release using worst case uh, kind of bounding in, uh, in, uh, meteorological conditions, and we calculate where is the maximum exposed individual, someone who's standing in the worst possible spot, what would that offsite dose be? Well, what we find is for this four kilogram release of HTO, um, you would get doses of 1,250 rem um, within 130 meters, and this would be fatal exposure to 100% of the population. Um, at 215 meters, you'd have doses greater than 500 rem, 50% uh, uh, fatal exposure. Uh, higher than 50 rem within 800 meters, that'd be a, kind of a non-fatal, that's kind of the cutoff for non-fatal acute radiation syndrome. Uh, 25 rem at uh, 1.2 kilometers, and this is the legal dose limit for emergency exposures uh, for workers during nuclear accidents. Um, greater than five rem within three and a half kilometers, and this is legal dose limit for radiation workers under normal conditions. And then if we want to see the normal uh, limit for um, the public, we actually have to zoom the map out a little bit. And we get a one rem dose at 10 and a half kilometers. And this is kind of the legal dose limit to begin evacuations. So what this tells you is that if we do this very simplified analysis on a very large tritium inventory, we get doses that are kind of simply unacceptable. This would not be acceptable for the design of a commercial fusion facility. And it's not the safety that we want to put forward as a new technology. So the question is, what's wrong with this analysis I've done and how do we change these numbers? And so the way we can think about it are different design and analysis pathways that we can use to reduce these offsite consequences. Um, the first method that we can kind of think about broadly is talking about the hazards. 
And these are ways that we can think about that source term and that um, the source term and the dispersion factor, things that we can do to try to reduce those numbers. So the first thing you can do is think about how to reduce the inherent hazards by design. What if we physically changed the design of our commercial fusion facility so we didn't have a 12 hour processing time, but instead we had a four hour processing time? Uh, because we were just doing simple multiplication, you can imagine that's gonna be a factor of three reduction in our tritium inventory, which is gonna have significant impacts on our offsite consequences. So we're reducing the inherent hazard present just by changing our design. Um, another thing we can do is we can think about how to reduce our inherent hazard by analysis. Instead of changing the device, let's think about how we're uh, kind of calculating these offsite consequences. So instead of doing a very simplistic, um, use the worst case meteorological conditions, what if we use site-specific meteorological conditions or site-specific population maps that more accurately reflected um, who might be around the facility and what types of weather patterns we might see? We could probably significantly change that dispersion factor and help kind of reduce those further. Uh, the final way we can reduce hazards is thinking about reducing the effective hazard by design. And this is kind of how do you mitigate the hazards, uh, the potential hazards of a commercial facility. So in this case, the most common thing you can think about is kind of a containment facility. And this is something that you see for commercial fission. The idea of putting a box or a building around your fusion facility that can either prevent all tritium from being released or significantly reduce the amount of tritium that's being released. So maybe we're not releasing the four kilograms, we're re re releasing a much smaller number than four kilograms. Uh, kind of the second major way we can think about trying to reduce these offsite consequences are through consequence probability. Maybe we can try to reduce the probability of an accident happening or um, kind of reducing, and this could be reducing the probability by design, what if we have redundant pumps or we have multiple systems that can ensure safety and reduce the probability that an accident occurs. Um, we can also reduce the probability by analysis. This is more thinking through how are we performing this analysis and what are the different events that can lead to these accidents. Instead of assuming an accident does happen, what if we determine the probability that we have this worst case accident? And this leads down to a path of something that's called probabilistic risk assessment. Let's not consider just what can go wrong, but how likely it is to go wrong. And then we can try to balance the hazards versus the probability to kind of calculate risk overall. Uh, the final way to kind of reduce offsite consequences is a much simpler way. It's just um, kind of change your consequence evaluation method and your acceptance limit. Um, maybe the limits we're using are outdated or don't re necessarily reflect the best understanding we have of health physics or societal goals. So you could potentially change the limits to better reflect your uh, facility. So what happens if we take these techniques and uh, kind of apply it to new technology? Well, here was our base case of the worst case release analysis, and it was uh, greater than one rem out to 10 kilometers. Um, maybe if we revised our valuation limit, we could say, okay, we're now gonna allow up to two rem. And so that kind of brings our, our kind of bounding circle out from 10 kilometers down to six and a half. Well, what if instead of that, we tried to reduce that inherent hazard by design? So we reduced our exhaust processing time from 12 hours down to four hours. In that case, we would bring in the circle uh, further and we'd find that we'd have that greater than one rem dose at five kilometers now instead of 10 kilometers because we've significantly reduced the inventory. Um, another thing we could do was start to look again at those kind of that site dispersion that we're performing. What if we sharpen our pencil on what type of release we're having? Well, if we run the numbers, we can find that we can reduce our dispersion factor by a, about a factor of 10 to a 90% reduction. And this brings in the circle even farther from 10 kilometers down to two and a half kilometers. Uh, finally, let's say we kind of reduce this effective hazard by design and use a containment structure. Um, in that case, we could reduce it from that 10 kilometers down to even uh, 500 meters. And these are all kind of just really quick and simple ways you could think about how are we doing different combinations of changing the design, changing mitigation features or changing analysis as ways to try to reduce those offsite hazard consequences for commercial fusion. Each one of these are gonna have significant challenges and limitations and you could do multiples of these in kind of in sequence with each other. And so when we take a look at these, um, each one of these are gonna have uh, impacts on regulatory simplicity, economic viability, and technical feasibility. So if we talk about reducing the hazards by designer analysis, it allows for really, really simple analysis and regulation. We can use this really simple analytic method and show to a regulator facility safe, but if I'm gonna significantly limit your tritium inventory that you have on site, it might limit the design and operation of the facility. It might not be technically feasible or economically viable. 
if we talk about kind of reducing the effective hazard by design by using mitigation methods or by using probability arguments to show that our facility is safe, it's going to allow us a lot more design flexibility, but it's going to require a much more complex analysis and might require safety related systems that can increase the, the time associated with construction and the costs associated with construction. And so while it might be technically feasible from a physics side, it might not be viable economically. Um, finally, changing consequence evaluation limits uh, really allows us to use our existing designs analysis, but requires kind of a more in-depth discussion with the public in terms of um, what is the safety of this facility and are we okay with it. And so this ends up kind of being one of the really big challenges looking at commercial fu fusion moving forward. It's how do we want to balance the design that we're using, the analysis we're doing, and the kind of the, how these are going to impact the regulatory simplicity and economic viability moving forward of the technology. So I've gone a fair bit over time, so I'll go ahead and wrap up. Um, but kind of in conclusion, I think it's important for people in this industry, especially in the physics side, to remember that fusion is not necessarily a born safe technology and that we have commercial, uh, commercial fusion is gonna have offsite hazards that we must control or mitigate. Um, we have the technology to do it, but we also need to think about how tritium hazards could dominate the licensing requirements if we don't limit them through different technology choices. Uh, designers are going to have to try to balance this technical feasibility, regulatory simplicity, and economic viability to help ensure uh, commercially viable fusion technology in the future. And that a lot of the design analysis choices that we make now are potentially going to impact the licensing processes, engineering requirements, and kind of level of regulatory review for commercial fusion moving forward in the future. Um, commercial fission, I think, is a great example on what happens when you get this kind of calculus wrong and you end up with very, very high regulatory burdens because you didn't think about inherent safety from the beginning. And I think commercial fusion has the chance to do it right from the first place and kind of really see safety baked in from the very beginning. So with that, I will take your questions. Thank you very much, Patrick. Um, as a reminder, uh, please use the um, hand raising option in the chat. And uh, I think, Patrick, you have the, the possibility to allow people to talk. Uh, yes, I believe so. Yeah, I'm looking at the, there we go. Um, Alex, I think you're unmuted. Or you can unmute yourself, I think. Yeah, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, uh, first of all, thank you for the for the talk, Patrick. I, I think it has been very, very interesting. I work on the, on the demo fuel cycle, so this for me was like a broader approach. Uh, but I have uh, one question. Uh, in slide 16, if you could uh, go over there real quick. Yes. Oh, apparently that crashed it. So give me one sec. If you want to start asking your question, I'll go ahead and Yes, click. yes. It's just that uh, it, it caught my, my eye. Uh, it's the slide where you theoretically substitute this, um, this cogeneration plan for the, for the fusion. Uh, yes. Power plant. I was a bit surprised uh, about the, um, the electric power. I, I know it's just an exercise of, okay, what would happen if you know, uh, but I don't know if it's realistic to have uh, a fusion power plant with only 200 megawatts of electric power. Yeah, that's that's very fair. Um, in the end, in this case, I selected the 200 megawatt electric uh, for two reasons. One, it scaled very nicely with the uh, previous inventory example I gave uh -huh. with 500 megawatt thermal using a 40% efficiency. And yeah. then also it somewhat matched um, the current cogeneration facility that's there. Okay, but I see. So it's yeah. just a matter of the, having a nice example to expand and explain, okay, yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. It just yeah, got, no, it, got my attention a bit, and was like a bit, a bit confused about that. But it's, it's, it's. Okay. Yeah, no, I know there's a lot of ongoing discussion in the fusion yeah. community of what are the minimum viable sizes for, yes, for commercial fusion facilities going forward, and is there a sweet spot on that thermal yes. fusion power output? Exactly. Uh, and then uh, another one. Yeah. Uh, in the slide uh, eleven, see eleven, twelve. I think it was eleven. Okay. Um, it was. If I recall correctly, it was about the uh, the tritium inventory. Yes. Uh, so, um, are you working with any um, Q 
fuel, fuel cycle uh, uh, scheme or, or model, or are you just taking uh, oh. your numbers for the uh, for the residence time, uh, the the treating inventory from literature, or are you working there on developing any any model regarding this uh, this matter? Uh, no, for the work that I'm doing uh, personally, it's uh, taking numbers from literature. Okay. Uh, the bigger focus is, yeah, how do these fit into a larger framework mm -hmm. for licensing? So what I do is I'm grabbing the numbers from literature and trying to find the discussion to inform mm -hmm. what are the what's the base inventory for a safety analysis. I see. Because, well, I have a couple of friends working on simulations for the fuel cycle and mm -hmm. a balance of plan of the theoretical future demo. And every time I talk to them, they are having a really hard time uh, finding numbers in literature that match each other. So what they find is like there are many different uh, numbers considering different um, technologies, different designs, and none of them match. So they are having a really hard time trying to uh, harmonize all that uh, information. I wonder if you're having uh, a bit of the same issue here. No, I, I have as well. Um, a lot of it comes down to starting to understand the different methods that people are using to calculate things like um, how much tritium that you inject in actually fuses before it exits mm -hmm. through the exhaust. Yeah. Um, there are a number of experts that have, I can already tell you, very different views on what those numbers should be. Yes. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, if you, I'd be happy to get in touch with them and we can kind of compare notes, but it's there's a reason that I use things like residence time um, based on work. Uh, there's Professor Abdu out at, I believe, UCLA, who's written on this extensively. Um, yes, yes, and he yeah, has I some, know the work of Abdu, yeah. Yeah, and he has some really good ways of how to do back of the envelope calculations to calculate these numbers. Yes. Um, at the end of the day, this is going to be a very detailed engineering exercise for commercial fusion, designing mm -hmm. systems and analyzing these systems. Definitely. And uh, the challenge I run into is just you're trying to prove the safety of a plane before the Wright brothers have actually flown the first plane. Yes, that's true. And that's so true. Yeah. It's, a, it's a bit of an exercise in best estimates. I see, I see. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. That's all okay, for me. The I think we have time for one more question. Um, if you can't find the hand raising option, you're feel free to um, write us in the chat or directly into the Q&A box. Oh, there we go. I'll go ahead. Uh, Ian? Hi, uh, can you hear me? Thank you so yes. much. For, uh, thank you so much for the talk. It was very, very interesting. Uh, my question is that uh, since tritium has a very short half-life, mm -hmm. only about uh, 12 years, um, mm -hmm. and if you compare this to the fuels used in fusion reaction, in fission reactions, yes. obviously very much longer half-lives, um, do you think that any environmental damage caused by uh, the tritium poisoning would obviously be very short term? Well, relatively short term. So do you think the comparison with reaction is fission reactors is fair or should you rather be comparing it with something like coal power generation? Great question. Um, I think, yeah, the half-life argument ends up becoming a bit of a double-edged sword. By having a low half-life or short half-life, um, it does mean that we're getting a lot more energy out over a short period of time. So while I don't think acute tritium releases into the environment necessarily have the same impact that let's say uh, spent nuclear fuel or nuclear waste does. Um, we still have to remember that the half-life is long enough that it matters for public discussion. Um, even with a 12.3 yeah, year half-life, if you had a massive release of tritium into the water, you're still talking decades before you'd start to see that water approach back to kind of background levels. So while it doesn't necessarily have the very, very long-term effects um, that commercial fission does and the challenges that commercial fission does, um, I think even small amounts of tritium can cause maybe pub more public concern than public hazard. 
Um, a really good example is uh, uh, fission power plants in the United States, or actually fission power plants worldwide, produce small amounts of tritium during operation. Um, generally, uh, can-do reactors will produce the most. Um, light water reactors will produce about two orders of magnitude less. And they're producing on the order of about two grams per year. Um, it's a big controversy in the United States when communities around fission power plants will find tritium in their, in their groundwater and in their water supplies. Uh, because tritium isn't really naturally occurring, you can detect it on very, very minute levels. I mean, we're talking pico becquerels per liter, um, incredibly, incredibly small levels. But still, there's a lot of public concern because the idea is, oh, the, the, the power plant down the road is putting radioactive material in our water, even if they don't have a context for what that number is. And so I think that's a really big challenge of understanding and appreciating the public concern over release of radiological materials in the environment. So tritium definitely does have that long life advantage, but I think there are some other unique public challenges associated with tritium and the fact that it is so easily, um, it so easily escapes from systems and the fact that it can make it into water is something important to deal with. Okay, thank you. Thanks.